so thanks to Janet and to Chris for the invitation and, and to all of you for coming. Um, what Janet didn't mention, I think, was that I actually got the invitation, I think, on the day that I moved. <laughs> <laughs> so they really don't lose any time. Um, so when the invitation came through, I was really, I moved with my partner Fanny from London um, about six weeks ago. And we were just mired in boxes and books and bubble wrap. And so when ja Janet was asking what I'd like to talk about, I really think that, that seemed like the natural thing to talk about, the kind of, um, that, that certain chaos that you get when you move house, when you're living out of boxes, when things haven't quite settled, or when the dust hasn't quite settled yet. So the kind of the, the title that came to mind, Unpacking My Library, is from an essay by Walter Benjamin that he wrote in the early 30s. Um, and it's a point when Benjamin, who was a huge book collector, had just got his, his collection out of storage. And he's talking about just that moment. And that essay finishes with the line, every passion borders on the chaotic, but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. So what I was suggesting to Janet and to Chris that I could talk about today is, I suppose, that, that moment when, when memories are feeling maybe slightly chaotic. And they, they asked me to, I suppose, introduce myself and, I suppose, to give some sense of the journey I've, I've had. Uh, to St. Ives, and, and I suppose to give a bit of the background about what's shaped my thinking um, in that time. So I'm going to talk for about 30, 40 minutes, um, and I'm going to talk about two things. I think first, give a sense of some of the projects I've worked on in the past, um, which are quite diverse. I think I've, I've worked um, primarily as a curator and an editor and a writer, but also a lecturer and a fundraiser, and then I also set up an art school in London two years ago. So. I'm going to hopefully give a bit of a sense of, of that range of projects. The second part of this, the talk will be a bit of a shift, and it's actually going to be a short reading from a project I'm working on at the moment, um, a kind of book project, actually, that I've been working on for a couple of years, which is a history of fictional artists. So it's looking at all of the examples of artists when they crop up in, in novels, so starting with Balzac, but working all the way through till today. So those will be the two parts of the talk and then as Janet said there'll be time for questions afterwards which will be strictly off the records and Alvin's <laughs> going to stop <laughs> filming at that yeah, stage. No. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So to begin, um, I guess I mean just the very kind of personal stuff. I was, I was born in Sussex and um, my parents, well, my mum is a, a musician and a secondary school teacher and my dad was a, um, at the time an astronomer and his research when I was growing up was on the dark side of the moon and he was that kind of part of a very particular generation of English scientists who were basically influenced by Pink Floyd mm -hmm. and by prog rock <laughs> <laughs> and so he started his PhD in the late 70s it was literally about the dark side of the moon and so I grew up in this quite itinerant um, community of eccentric English scientists who would dot around anywhere I suppose that had <coughs> mountains and, and telescopes so that was my childhood, and we eventually settled in, in Suffolk, where, where I went to secondary school. And throughout that whole time, we would, we'd come to Cornwall every year, in October or November, always staying at Gwythian. And so, for me, I suppose Tate St. Ives was the museum that I knew earliest and probably still know best. So, I mean, to come back here now has just been really a tremendous privilege. Um, I didn't actually study art history, I studied literature. Um, and I think there's a sense in which now I, I realise that when I'm thinking about art, it's often through the filter of, of reading, which is kind of partly why I wanted to, to talk about unpacking my library today. So when it's thinking about Manet, it's thinking about Manet through the lens of Baudelaire's writing about Manet, or Proust's writing about Manet. Or if you're thinking about the work of the British modernists, it's thinking about how that's in tandem or divergent <coughs> with the writing of Pound or Joyce or Wolfe or Eliot. And then I think kind of really critically for me as a, a teenager, it was encountering the American minimalists and the work of Dan Flavin, but almost hearing it after having listened to the music of Steve Reich. So I think for me, there's always this kind of double, doubleness, the kind of how reading leads to looking. And so when I was studying, uh, although I study literature, all of my friends were artists. They all went to art school. <coughs> and so I started <coughs> naturally through that to do studio visits. And I kind of realized at that time that Artists were some of the best readers I've ever met. I'd always go to these studios and I'd just end up talking about books as much as talking about art. And still, many of the best recommendations I've had are from those kind of studio settings. 
seems to me also that I think the art world is this kind of tremendous place for, um, for cross-fertilization or for, for kind of hybrid ways of working. And if we look back through the 20th century, there's this really great tradition of people doing many more things than one. So there are kind of all kinds of artists who are also working as critics. I mean, Heron would be kind of one that I'm sure everyone knows very well here, but, you know, coming through to Smithson and to Judd and so on, and then going back further to poet critics like Baudelaire or in the mid-century like Frank O'Hara. And I think today, in the 21st century, that, that kind of hybrid condition is one that's become pretty familiar. If you check any kind of byline in an art journal or magazine, you tend to see the fact that people are not just a curator, but also a curator and a critic and an editor. Or they're living between London and Berlin or St. Ives and London. And so that kind of condition that of, um, of in-betweenness, I think, has really been something that um, I thought about a lot and has really, uh, has really influenced kind of the way in which I, which I, approach, I approach art. And I use this, this slide of Courbet's great painting of his studio from, I think it's from about 1855. And he said at the time that he wanted to paint the whole world coming to him. So it's all of his peers and all of his elders and contemporaries coming to his studio. And this idea of, and I, I mean, it kind of seems totally apt to be talking about this in Porthmere, but the idea of studio as a very sociable space, as a place for all kinds of conversations that can happen, something that's been, it's been really crucial for me. Um, after I finished my studies, the first um, job I had was actually working for a, a philanthropic organisation called Outset, which is a contemporary art fund at the time based in London, but now has branches everywhere from Tel Aviv to New York to, uh, to Edinburgh. Um, and I was program director there for a couple of years, which basically entailed raising money from, from private patrons and from uh, public organisations. Um, we would then give that money to artists to realise major projects that they wouldn't have been able to realise otherwise. And then finally would donate that work to museums. So over the course of about 10 years, Outset donated, I think, more than 100 works to Tate and continues to do many things there. So these are just several projects I was involved with. On the left, this is a piece by Thomas Saraceno outside of um, the Hayward Gallery in 2009. Um, on the right, it's South London Gallery in Peckham, and we helped raise funds for um, an artist's residency flat at the back, of, the back of the gallery. And then at the bottom, we worked very closely with the Royal College of Art. Um, where I went, went on to be a tutor sometime later. While working at Outset, I suppose the project that I was kind of most closely involved with was fundraising for a film by Steve McQueen, uh, the British artist, um, when he represented Britain in, in Venice in, at the Biennale in 2009. He made this film called Giardini, which was about the Giardini in the kind of off-season, the point at which the art crowds don't see it. And so it had these stray dogs wandering around and kind of people, these kind of random encounters. And this was around a point for Steve where he, I think, was moving from an artist to maybe the kind of the film director that he's, he's gone on to receive so much acclaim and, you know, get Oscars and so on. So that was what I was doing with Outset for a couple of years. Around that time, I became quite involved with a journal in New York called Bidoon, um, a quarterly journal. Um, which looked at the Middle East, basically. It was set up in, in New York in 2004. And the title Bidoon is a Farsi word that translates to something like without or from elsewhere. And it was a big project of Bidoon to look at the Middle East, but from not within the Arab world. So to see, look, to kind of examine the ways in which the Arab world was communicated outside of that. And it was set up in New York in this kind of post 9-11 moment where I think there was a certain kind of phobia about, about that region. And I think it was through these kind of conversations and through this kind of writing that I started travelling um, more and more to the Middle East. This is, um, the image here is the Bidoon Library, which has been touring for about the last five years now, and is a collection of pulp fiction that the editors of Bidoon have collected from flea markets in Cairo and Beirut. So I started travelling around this time, maybe six or seven years ago, to the Middle East, um, it was a moment when there was a huge amount of money there. It was just before the, the crisis happened. And all of these museums started to, to spring up. Um, I mean, these images are quite odd because one of them is computer generated, but all of them look like they're computer generated. <laughs> um, so on the top left, it's the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha in Qatar, which is designed by I.M. Pei, who you might know is designing the, the Louvre extension in Paris. And then 
the bottom, this is, um, this is a, a hotel in Dubai where the art fair is, is held every year. And on the right, it's the Sadiat Island complex, which has been in the news recently for all kinds of human rights abuses um, in Abu Dhabi. So I started traveling more and more to the Middle East at this kind of quite complex period. And, and although I sometimes visit these, these museums, it was a kind of very different side of that world that I actually ended up spending more time with. Um, these images on the left-hand side are of um, an art school in Beirut that was founded about three years ago called Ashkal Alwan. And on the right-hand side, um, an art school in Ramallah in the West Bank uh, called the International Academy of Art Palestine. Um, so I started teaching very occasionally both of these schools. They both rely just really on NGOs and on people volunteering their time. But it just seemed to be a really crucial moment in the Middle East when a lot of this work was getting a kind of international visibility. And yet they didn't really have the resources, they didn't really have the art schools who were teaching anything other than a kind of very craft-oriented approach to work. So that was, that was a kind of big part of, um, of what I was doing, I think, six, seven years ago. And again, to kind of come back to books and to reading, I often found that I was approaching these places through the lens of certain writers. So whether that was Jean Genet and going to Beirut and going to the West Bank, or whether it was Orhan Palmer and visiting Istanbul for the first time, I think it's quite a, quite a kind of common experience. After Bedouin, I went on to become associate editor at Freeze magazine. Um, some of you may know Freeze is a well, originally British art magazine that was founded <laughs> in 1991, um, around the time when the YBAs, or the generation that, that came to be known as the, the young British artists, were just about graduating and beginning to coalesce. And actually, on the first ever issue of Freeze, this was the first ever interview with Damien Hirst and Damien Hirst's first ever butterfly painting on the cover. And so I think Freeze in the early 90s was really quite associated with that, that, kind, of, that kind of art that was coming out of London. Um, probably drifted away from that slightly a bit later on, becoming a bit more international. It's just a selection of covers from recent years. And I read Freeze when I was a student and one of the things I really loved about it, or one of the things I really responded to, was the fact that it would write about literature or art or TV programs with the same kind of seriousness and the same kind of accessibility of voice that was just tremendously exciting. And I think that really comes about because the editors are a range of, I mean, to give a few examples, Jennifer Higgy in London is a novelist and a playwright, and Dan Fox in the New York office is a musician and runs a record label, and Jörg Heiser in the Berlin office is, um, is a, a philosophy professor in Austria. And so all of these, it was kind of a really exciting conversation to be part of. It's since diversified, and the three years that I was working at Freeze, we really started to think about what a magazine should be today. Uh, it shouldn't just be an object, it should be many other things. So we started to think about publishing as just another kind of broadcasting, I suppose. So on the left-hand side, this is an issue of, of Freeze from last year. On the right-hand side, it's a sister publication called Freeze DE, which is German language and with parallel texts that we launched a few years ago. And actually the first ever issue had uh, Linda on the cover, Linda who is currently a resident here in Port Mere. We also launched e-books and an annual writer's prize for young art critics with a prize of 2,000 pounds going to someone who'd never been published before. So it was really a kind of um, a time at which the magazine was expanding quite radically. Last year we also we did a talks program in New York um, which is on the right hand side, this is the, the Freeze Art Fair on Randall's Island in New York, which now happens every May. And we had a very diverse group of speakers from Joan Jonas in the top left, the pioneering video artist and performance artist from America, who will actually be representing America at the Venice Biennale next year. Through to Lydia Davis on the bottom left, um, short story writer and, and translator of Proust and Flaubert, who was um, awarded the International Man Booker a few years ago. I also organized several concerts while I was working at Freeze, which ranged from this in Shoreditch Church with um, Baby D, who's a transgender harpist from Pennsylvania, <laughs> through to Hercules and Love Affair in some warehouses in, in South London. And that kind of interest in music fed through to an exhibition I curated in France a few years ago. This quite odd museum in the east of France uh, called the Synagogue du Delme. Uh, the bottom slide is the, the museum itself. And the, the top slide is what they call the ghost house, or the guest house. 
which is for resident artists and is the, the, back, of, is back, the back of the museum, um, curated a show there called Schizophonia, which was about the kind of different stories that music can tell, or the different ways in which music can tell history. A few years ago, I started teaching at the Royal College of Art, um, and as well as at UCL, at UCL teaching art history, and at the RCA teaching on a, a programme called um, uh, Critical Writing in Art and Design, which is a master's programme, but one that teaches <coughs> anyone from art historians through to artists or design critics how writing can kind of be a, a part of their, their practice. Um, it's a really exciting bunch of tutors on the course, um, and it was a real privilege to work alongside people who I've really admired as writers and teachers. One of them is Brian Dillon, who has curated a show that's currently at Tate Britain called Ruin Lust. Um, this is a selection of, of images of, of Ruin Lust. I think the one on the right is drawing by uh, Joseph Gandhi from the late 18th century, and then this is Jane and Louise Wilson, the photo. Um, I taught a course at the Royal College called Ra Raiding the Icebox, which is the title of an exhibition that Andy Warhol organised in 1970 when he was invited by the Rhode Island Museum to basically raid their storage space. And they were really surprised to find that he didn't want to show their collection of hats, he wanted to show their collection of hat boxes. And it caused a huge amount of confusion that he would show not just like one pair of shoes but also the duplicate pair of shoes. And after a while they realised that what was being exhibited wasn't so much their collection, but what was being exhibited was Andy Warhol, uh, as the <laughs> director said. So I, I taught a course called Raiding the Icebox, which was thinking about the icebox as a kind of, a kind of metaphor or image of, of memory <coughs> or of archiving. And so thinking about different ways in which writing can respond to that. So the project I mentioned earlier, Open School East, is... Um, a difficult thing to explain, but it came about, like many things do, from a series of late night conversations with friends. Um, essentially what it is, is an art school and community centre in East London. It opened a year ago in a former public library in Hackney, and it was really an idea I had with a few friends, which was, what if we were to provide free education, free studio spaces for a number of artists, and what if, in exchange for that, free studio space and for that free tuition, they take a really active role in reopening a public building that had been closed down. The library had been open for about 30 or 40 years but had been closed in the kind of recent like, swathe of closures and the archive had been moved elsewhere. So we took over the whole library and gave over the space to 12 artists who we, uh, we selected after a kind of international call for entries. These are, these are all of the artists here. And we had about 300 people apply from all over the world. And I think in the end, the artists we selected really were quite reflective of that range. Um, they ranged from a kind of a dancer through to a community organiser uh, through to a potter. And so a lot of the, the, the school opened its doors in September. And a lot of the sessions have been totally open to the public. Because it seemed to me that art schools or actually lots of universities don't really have any kind of meaningful connection with the, the neighbourhood that they occupy. So it was a way in which we could kind of embed a school within a, within a neighbourhood and make it somehow kind of more of a reciprocal relationship. It was a kind of way of thinking out loud or a way of, um, I suppose just in a very basic terms, adding something back to a community. So these are images on the top left. It's um, when we, were, we worked with an architect to build all the studio spaces and this is when it was halfway built. At the back, peeking through, you can see a mural of Tintin. Uh, that was done in the, the, the 90s, I think, that we kept. And so that's the seminar room, or the Tintin room. And in the right-hand side, there's a, it's, it's one of the seminars in that space. These are just a selection of posters from events that we've organised there recently. And then on the left-hand side, this is setting up for our Christmas party and a Christmas play that some of the students put on. And I should say that all of the fundraising we got for this, most of it came from the Barbican, um, uh, the in institution in London uh, but then we also fundraised from kind of private sources so, so Fanny, my partner, actually got some fundraising to provide free school lunches once a week for the students um, but we also had money to set up a ceramic studio um, which I think is here which is organised by a young artist called Aaron Angel who's actually, if you're interested, talking at Falmouth uh, next, next month um, Aaron set up a pottery called the Troy Town Art Pottery um, and it really came out of his experience as a young artist of 
wanting to experiment with clay, but so many ceramics departments having been closed down in recent years and not really having anywhere to work and also not really wanting to identify as a potter necessarily or to make vessels but wanting to have a kind of space where he could he could play around with materials so that's how that's how Troy Town came about and that's that's open and gives weekly public workshops we also run a radio show out of the school with um, local residents over the age of 60 or under the age of 18 who collaborate on a weekly radio show called, called Parallel Radio. And being in Dalston, there's lots of, um, kind of West Indian community there. So it's been really amazing to hear these people host a show and then to relay their memories of working with Bob Marley in the 60s and 70s and so on. So I think that's kind of, that's, that's almost the kind of overview of some of the things I've been doing in the last few years. And I think particularly with Open School East, it's, I'm realising probably shaping a lot of what I've been thinking about just in this first month of, of starting here in St Ives. Ideas about what does it mean to really have artists at the core of everything you do. Because it seems to me that Tate St Ives isn't quite an unusual situation in that respect, that the museum is here after all because artists lived here and continue to live here. Um, it's quite unusual. I mean, it's the only one of the Tate museums that has an artist residency programme. It's the only one of the Tate Museums that has the Barbara Hepworth studio that, that is exhibited. So I think having, having studios really at the kind of the middle of, of everything we're thinking about going forward, so it's not only about preserving that legacy, it's about producing the artists of the next 10 or 20 or 50 years from and, and through St. Ives. So the second part of this talk, I don't know how I'm doing for time. If I, Chris says, OK. <laughs> So the second part, as I mentioned, it, it's, it's really, it's going to be a reading, I think, and well, I'll see how much I can do without reading, but it's a project I've been thinking about for a while, and it's a, it's a history of fictional artists, or a history of artists in the modern novel, and it's quite rangy, and it, it covers e everything from, from Proust through to the Da Vinci Code, and, uh, and I'm going to try to do it in about 15 minutes, I think, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I should say that the image that we used for the poster, um, I mean, I'm sure lots of you know it, but it's of André Malraux, the, um, the French politician and writer, who in the late 40s wrote a book called Le Musée Imaginaire, which was translated into English as the, um, the Museum Without Walls. And so I kind of wanted to think about, you know, if we're going to think about writing a history of fictional artists, then, you know, this, this somehow seems a fitting image, a kind of imaginary, imaginary museum. So, artists have plenty of walk-on parts in fiction. Um, I mean, they're like any other profession in that respect. But they, they, they don't re tend to have major parts in novels, or many of the novels I've come across. They usually tend to kind of walk on, say something slightly bohemian, and then, and then le leave again. <coughs> and that's kind of, that's them forgotten. So, the kind of the novels that do focus in any sustained way on a fictional artist or a body of fictional artwork is actually quite unusual and, and forms this quite esoteric subcategory of, of modern fiction. But it doesn't really matter if the novel was written yesterday or if it was written in the 20th century. The chances are the artwork that's being described basically sounds the same. It will usually be a landscape and it will usually be painted by a man and the man will usually commit suicide at the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really oddly familiar, as you kind of see as we go along, but it's the thing that comes back and over and over again. And the kind of model for many of these artists is, is Gauguin, and particularly his time in Tahiti. And novelists as different as Somerset Maugham to Mario Vargas Llosa have, have kind of mined his Tahiti journals for, for different fictional ends, and you can really see the publishers emphasising that too. But you know, beyond these kind of basic char characteristics, the more specific details of the, the art are usually quite sparse. And I kind of wonder if that's maybe behind our common impulse to try to put images to some of these fictions. And there's a kind of small industry based around trying to pinpoint the references in, in Proust's novels. Um, the painting in, in Proust's book on the right, which is interestingly in French translated as, like, as per the kind of André Mauro Musée Imaginaire. So I'd argue that the kind of these sustained descriptions of fictional art are really the point <coughs> at which the membrane between art criticism and fiction are probably the most permeable 
And I guess it's not really any surprise that <coughs> many novelists who've written most compellingly about fictional art are also people who've written a good amount of art criticism. So I think of someone like Oscar, Oscar Wilde through to Susan Sontag or John Updike. They're all people who've kind of had a foot in, in both camps. And many of the books that have fictional artists in them take the kind of form of, um, of an account that by which we'd usually, we, usually, we usually write about art. So whether that's an, an account of a studio visit, as in John Updike's novel Seek My Face, or, or, or W.G. Seaboard's book, The Emigrants. But you also have these kind of <coughs> curious cases of the, the hoax biography, like this kind of infinite, infamous um, book by William Boyd, uh, by Nat Tate, who was said to be an abstract expressionist who committed suicide. Again, kind of, you'll see that this comes back off the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, but it was actually a huge hoax. Nat Tate didn't ever exist. Um, his name is actually a conflation of the National Gallery and the Tate. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> all of the images of his work are just archival pictures that were owned by the author. But Boyd roped in lots of different celebrities to give some kind of credence to this story. So Gore Vidal blurbed the book. His name was on the cover. David Bowie threw a launch party on <laughs> ap April the 1st. And all kinds of different celebrities were wheeled out <coughs> to say that not only did they really love Nat Tate's work, they actually remembered having met him. <laughs> and it was a kind of faintly embarrassing episode for many of the people involved. But um, this is an image here of the, the launch party with Bowie and the critic Matthew Collings and Jeff Koons kind of peeking through. But this kind of, it, I think it is illustrative of the way in which these fictions do have a life in the real world, that they can move beyond the confines of the page. So in a 1979 essay, John Berger wrote about a nude by Franz Hals, a nude that actually turns out to be completely made up. Stories arrive in the head in order to be told. Sometimes paintings do the same. So I guess what I want to ask here is what happens when writing about fictional objects begins to resemble art criticism? And does modern fiction's aversion to describing art speak to maybe a more generally held doubt about the adequacy of language to deal with, to deal with art? I'm going to take a few examples to kind of show what I'm talking about here. The very earliest, earliest pioneer of abstract painting never existed. Though he never existed, he was claimed as an influence by some of the greatest artists of the 20th century. The painter in question is the subject of Balzac's famous short story, The Unknown Masterpiece, from the 1830s, which is one of the, uh, the, the novelist's kind of most intense efforts to, to analyze the condition of being an artist. To give a very quick overview, if you're not familiar with it, it's about an artist named Frenhofer, set in, in the early 17th century. An artist called Frenhofer and his 10 years struggle to complete a painting called La Belle Noiseuse, or The Beautiful Troublemaker. But his struggle suddenly resolved when the young Poussin suggests that his mistress could sit for the elderly artist. So within hours, the masterpiece is completed. But on being called into the studio, Poussin and his mentor can see nothing but, I quote, confused masses of color and a multitude of strange lines, forming a dead wall of paint. <coughs> in one corner of the canvas, a single bare foot emerges from this dim, formless fog. Devastated, Frenhofer commits suicide and burns all of his studios. Nothing has heard of him again since. So the story is often read as kind of prophesying the, prophesying the heroic struggles of modernism. And though Balzac himself intended the story as a warning about overstepping formal conventions, um, it actually has held considerable sway ever since. Um, Picasso actually illustrated a, a book for his art dealer. This is, this is one of the illustrations here. And went on to move to the studio that he believed Frenhofer to have lived in, in Paris. And it was that studio that he completed Guernica in, in 36. Willem de Kooning, when he was struggling with his woman paintings in the late 40s, uh, read the story and it was very influential for him. And he actually thought that Frenhofer somehow prefigured cubism. And it's since become a kind of influence for all kinds of other things. This is a still from um, a Jacques Rivette film from the early 90s called La Belle Noiseuse, which is absolutely terrible. Don't watch it if you... <laughs> um, and then the story was also the, the, the subject of Richard Hamilton's final paintings that he made just before he died in 2011. And this is quite interesting in that this is, this is Poussin himself on the left and then 
Courbet and, and Titian, just in the kind of in the roles of each of the three artists in, in the story itself. And each of them, of course, appropriated images that, that Hamilton collaged. And then with the recli reclining nude in the, in the uh, foreground, rather than in the story where the only recognizable element was a, a single well-painted foot, here the, uh, the only element that um, is actually painted is the foot itself. Everything else is kind of somehow photographic, I think. So it was kind of, it was Hamilton updating this story, but for the 21st century. Novels about artists are completely awash with forgeries. I think there are probably, by my count, many more fake works than there are real works. So I want to wonder, what, wonder why this is. But one provisional explanation is that the artwork, the way that it functions in fiction, is often not as a kind of interesting object in itself, but as a kind of a ploy to make the plot move quicker. In other words, it's, um, it's what Alfred Hitchcock called a MacGuffin. Um, the MacGuffin was a, a term coined by, coined by Hitchcock, and it referred to a dramatic device whose physical form is, what he said, beside the point. All that matters is that it must seem to be of vital importance to the characters. So really, the MacGuffin, as Hitchcock put it, to Truffaut, could be anything at all. So the Maltese Falcon would be the classic example. It could be a Maltese Falcon, but it could be some secret papers. It really, it really could be anything at all. And I think, for me, that's the way that the art usually functions in novels. It's nothing more than an instrument of the plot or something that drives it along. And I, I, I wonder whether that's one reason why, um, why small paintings are often the kind of the norm in these books. Large, they have to be able to change hands very quickly. <laughs> so there are all kinds of fakes in novels. They kind of range from this Hieronymus Bosch, which features in William Gaddis's The Recognitions, uh, through to paintings by Van Eyck or fake Christian icons. Um, I kind of wonder why this is, and it's put quite well in Patricia Highsmith's book, Ripley Underground, when her anti-hero Tom Ripley, who's himself a sometime forger, quotes Van Megeren, the great forger of um, Vermeer, who says, an artist does things naturally without effort. A forger struggles, and if he succeeds, it's a genuine achievement. So I think there is this sense for me that really forgery is essentially a kind of more interesting activity for novelists than, than actually the, the nuts and bolts of creating a painting in honest fashion. And I think partly this is to do or relates to a kind of sneaking desire that might be quite broadly held, that the art world is nothing more than some kind of profitable sham. And I think you see this as played out in these novels, that the artists are usually alcoholics, um, art critics are usually these kind of... Um, basically like kind of faux intellectuals or often drunkards too, um, collectors of benevolent fools. Curators, oddly, don't really function that much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll maybe let you work out why that is. <laughs> but it, I, but I, I actually seriously wonder why it is. And, and one novel from recent years which did feature a curator quite, um, quite central, in quite a central way, um, Maybe I could read the first line of this novel, and if anybody knows it, then, then you could shout out, because it's quite unlikely. But the, the first line of this novel is, Renowned curator Jacques Saunier staggered through the vaulted archway of the museum's grand gallery. He lunged for the nearest painting he could see, a Caravaggio. Da Vinci Code? It's the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is, it's kind of this amazing early scene where he gets, he gets overpowered by the weight of the art which is this kind of funny metaphor for what curating <laughs> might be at points. So, there you go. So as I kind of mentioned, many of the novelists who've written about fictional artists have also written criticism. So anyone from Aldous Huxley to Thomas Mann, Susan Sontag, Paul Oster, Virginia Woolf. And indeed, one of the great novels of the 20th century, Proust's In Search of Lost Time, began what life as a work of criticism. And the book itself, or the, the series of novels, is about 1.5 million words. And over that, the course of those books, something like 100 real-life artists are mentioned, and everyone from Giotto to Coro. But I think that the, kind of the two artists who are mentioned the most are Vermeer and Whistler. And the painting that's most regularly referred to is, is Manet's Olympia from 1863. And it's gossiped about endlessly. You know, the books itself, they're kind of roughly set in the late 19th century. But at one point, a duchess exclaims, Nowadays, nobody is the least surprised by it. 
it looks just like an ang. <laughs> and so Olympia is one painting that's talked about. The other is Seascape at Burke. But amid all of these real-life masters, people that we kind of know today, also mingle Proust's real-life contemporaries, kind of forgotten critics, forgotten academicians. <coughs> Above all of these people towers just one fictional artist called Elstir, who is famed uh, for his seascapes. And according to the narrator Marcel, his seascapes break up that medley of, impres of impressions which we call vision. In fact, many have tried to identify the source of Elstir's greatest painting, um, this painting by Manet, the, the, the portrait at um, Bordeaux, is often said to be the model for it. But there's not really any consensus. Other people say it's Hokusai, other people say it's Riyadh. And so Elstir is one of the three kind of main characters, main artists in Proust's novels. The others are a composer, Van Tai, and uh, the novelist, Bergotte. These three artist figures influence Marcel, the narrator's crucial decision at the end of the final volume to become, uh, to become a, a novelist. And although it's kind of weird that the novelist himself, his writing isn't ever really mentioned, it's the paintings that are dwelt on the most. So, and intriguingly, the novelist Bergotte, his defining scene isn't to do with writing or with reading, it's to do with looking. Um, he goes to see Vermeer's view of Delft from 1660 after having read a newspaper article about it because he wants to find out about this little, what he calls a little patch of yellow wool. And as he's looking at the painting, he has a stroke and collapses in front of it. And his dying thought is, that is how I should have written, like that little patch of yellow wool. And I think that sums up a lot of what's going on in, in many of these novels, this kind of <coughs> feeling that somehow language isn't quite enough to explain the object. It isn't quite sufficient when faced with an artwork. I'd like to finish with Virginia Woolf, because I think among many other things, Proust's novels <coughs> constitute a kind of lifelong apprenticeship in looking. And I guess, you know, writing a novel is a tremendously time-consuming activity. And the novelist's content is the passage of time itself. It's his time spent looking and reading and researching, and these are all things that go back into the, the novel. And I think it's rare that these things are mapped onto the book so clearly as when an artist is being dealt with. Perhaps the most famous example of a writer's slow progress being mapped onto the unfolding of a novel is the final line of Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse from 1927, when the rather nervous painter Lily Briscoe, who's been wrestling with all kinds of problems to do with composition, finishes a semi-abstract landscape and the final line is, it was done, it was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue, I have had my vision. So the, the end of the book coincides with the end of the painting. They kind of come to seem like much the same, even though there is this doubt, perhaps on the, the behalf of the writer, that, that writing never can be quite sufficient to painting. So I think I'm going to finish there, and uh, there'll be time for questions afterwards. Yes, just before we start the questions, yes. before, you turn the, before you turn the camera off, I'd like to say... Thank you very much indeed, because I think that's just so interesting. It's marvellous to hear all the things you've done. And what I wanted to say particularly, that we'd all like to welcome you very warmly to St. Ives. We hope you'll be very happy here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.